All right, hello. Hello, good people. I need some friends to come on in with me today. I'm going to flip my camera around in a minute. <clears throat> come on, tag a friend, tag a loved one, tag anybody, tag an enemy. Tell them Dr. Johnson is about to go live with some exciting uh, kingdom news. And uh, they need to come on in and uh, jump on with us for, I don't know, maybe about 30 minutes. We'll see. We'll see. I hope you got some questions for me when uh, when we get when we get going here. I'd like some feedback. Alrighty. Alrighty. I want you to uh, to share share with some friends. <clears throat> Come on in with us. And uh, like the page, <clears throat> excuse me, share the page, and uh, we're gonna we're gonna get kicked off here in a little bit. As soon as I get, uh, as soon as I get some company. All right, I'm waiting. Hope you're doing well wherever you are, um, around the world on the world wide web. Uh, it's always good to uh, talk about the exciting things that are going on in the kingdom of God. Okay? I promise you, I'll share some real exciting things with you today. As it relates to uh, 2023 and where the Holy Spirit's taking us uh, for this season. Hello, Shirley! Cheryl, it's been a long, 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 long time since I've seen you. Um, I'm trying to remember, did we, were you here at your brother's funeral? I uh, can't remember. Please excuse me, but um, uh, you know we were great friends uh, for 40 years. I met, I met Roger in the early 80s. And um, so good to see you. Tag somebody else, let them know. Uh, Pastor Johnson is live right now, and I got some great things to uh, to share with you. Thank you, thank you. Bless you, bless you, bless you for coming on. Let me let me see a few more friends. Say hey, say hello. There you go, there you go. Hope you're doing well. Yes, come on, come on. Bring bring some other friends in on on this live today, and uh, I'm not. I'm not a professional at, uh, uh, at at video. Okay, you were sitting right by Heather on the organ. Okay, very well, very well. Um, yeah, Roger, Roger and I, we we talked at least once a week. I mean, hardly a week would ever go by. Uh, in all of the years we've been knowing each other, hardly a week go by. Uh, maybe two at the most. Uh, but we probably spoke at least once, once a week, once every other week for all of the many years. Hi, Vanessa. How you doing? Love you. Looking forward to uh, you guys coming, coming home. Alrighty, alrighty. Come on in. Let me have a few more friends and families to come on in. And, and then we're going to break some bread together. I want to tell you. Uh, the wonderful news uh, that's uh, that's coming down the pike right now, uh, as it relates to what what the Holy Spirit's doing uh, in the body of Christ. Yes, yes, yeah. You did you did play for me back in the day. I remember that. I do way back in the day. Yep, I do remember. You still got gifted hands. I, I'm, I know that talent never leaves you, so I'm sure you, you still can work that, work that organ. But when you come back to Charleston again, please look me up. Please call me. I'm gonna give you my number and everything today. Uh, so I'd love to, I'd love to talk with you. All right, guys, uh, we're gonna, we're gonna roll a ball here uh, today. Uh, I want to tell you about the one thousand dollar giveaway. 
that's going to be attached to the releasing of my book. When I was on last week, I told you uh, that the book was not due to be released until January 30. That's what they had had a schedule um, to, uh, to be released on the 30th of, uh, of January. Uh, but over the past week, they, uh, my, my uh, publisher called and wanted to know that I want to up the date. And I told them, yes. They said, when? I said, well, Friday. This Friday. So tomorrow, in fact, if you, if you go online now, uh, you, you probably, you should see the dates updated. So as of today, you can order. And as of tomorrow, uh, the book is going to uh, uh, be sent out. So uh, I recommend, I suggest that you order the book through Zulon Press. Now you can order it through Books A Million, Bonds and Noble, Walmart has it on their website, um, Amazon on their website, it's, it's, it's all over now. Uh, but because Zulon Press is the publisher, uh, the arrangement that I have with them, it just works better overall. But you can order it from any venue, you know, that's convenient for you. I just, I just have a preference for Zulon Press, okay? So this, this is the book. Uh, I started to pen this book in March of this year, and I wanna, I'm going to go over the, the table of contents with you so you can get the meat of, uh, of what I'm discussing in the book. But the title is the book, of the book is The Autopsy of Slavery, and the Bible, subtopic, Christ's triumph over slavery and bringing unity to the body. And the reason why the subtitle is just as critical as the title is because all of us who have a Bible, uh, we, 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 we hopefully believe what's in it, okay? And because of the, the, the culture in which we were all raised over the last uh, four or five centuries in America, we have gotten the Bible uh, from a whole different vantage point from what's actually in the Bible. And that's why I'm sure you've asked yourself a thousand times, why do we have all these different religious denominations? And we only got one Bible, one God. Why do we have all these denominations? You know, why, why black and white people go to different churches? I know you've asked those questions a thousand times. If you didn't ask them out loud, you ask yourself the question. I'm going to answer all those questions for you in this book. When I tell you that the Holy Spirit uh, has trained me and have been training me for four decades uh, to do what I'm doing now, uh, take my words for it. Okay. Hello, Courtney. Um, anyway, so uh, here's, here's, here's how the, 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 the giveaway prize for the launching of the book is going to go. I'm going to be giving away $1,000, uh, $500 uh, to the first place uh, a person who gets picked um, uh, from the drawing, 300 to the second person, and 200 to the third. Now, way, the way this has to work is... When you order the book, and this is this is the only way I can, you know, uh, keep up with the accuracy of who's going to be sending me information so I can put your name in the drawing, okay? You have to buy the book, write your name in the book, and then take a photo of it so that I can validate that that's your copy, and then send it to my email or my telephone number, my email address is dr.edwardleejohnson at gmail.com. I'll, I'll put it at the end of this live feed so you can see it. Dr.edwardleejohnson at gmail.com, as well as uh, you can send it to my phone, 843-330-7807. You send that information to me. Once you got the book in your hand, I will print it off and make sure it goes into the pot so that when we get ready to do the drawing, once we get up to 100 people, uh, I'll be prepared to do the drawing, and you may be the blessed winner. I don't use the word lucky because I don't believe in luck. I want to give this away as an incentive to get people to get the book because I realize how important this information is and how limited it is the, the, it is across the nations. And so this is just an incentive for, for me to get people to to get the book from, from California 
uh, to New York City, from New York City to uh, Jacksonville, Florida, uh, all across the, 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 the belt way of, uh, of the United States and across the planet, the UK. I want everybody to know that the Holy Spirit has birthed in a rhema word for the body of Christ and uh, my assignment, this is, this, is, this is what I'm called to do uh, to minister this word. Uh, this particular book is book number 28. Uh, I think it's somewhere in there. If you go onto my website, mynewimagebooks.com, you'll see all my books there. So we're going to be doing a tremendous giveaway um, uh, for the first several months of, of this book hitting the market. So go online. You can go online now and order it. Go order it um, from, from ZulonPress.com. When you go on Zulon Press, you simply type in the title of the book, The Autopsy of Slavery, and, and it'll pop up. But as I said, you can go to Barnes & Noble if you want, Books A Million, uh, Walmart, um, 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 Amazon, it's, it's everywhere. You can, you can get it. My preference is Zulon Press, but it's, it's up to you. All right, let's get into, let's get into the meat of the matter. I want to read to you, um, some of the, uh, the four words, uh, that's in the book. But before I do that, let me give you all the topics that we're discussing in the book. I'm going to the table of contents and give you all the topics. Uh, in chapter one, I'm discussing slavery in the Old Testament. I'm giving you the history of where Christians uh, got their information from uh, in the Bible to justify slavery in America, okay? I'm going to show you how all this works. So we're going, we're going back um, 3,500 years because Moses uh, gave the Israelites uh, their, their laws and instruction as to how this would be handled uh, uh, among them. So I'm giving you the clarity as to what's in the Bible as opposed to what you've been told. Chapter 2, I'm talking about slavery in the New Testament. Chapter 3, I'm dealing with the trauma of slavery and the residue of, of what is left here today and it's so prevalent and evident among us, even though we may not attribute that uh, to uh, some of the uh, 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 situations that are going on in our culture today. But you, once you get this, the understanding of what I'm sharing, you'll, you'll, you'll see it. It's very clear. And then in chapter four, I'm talking about shadow slavery. Okay. And what you need to know, hands down, is that shadow slavery that was practiced in European colonies, and that includes America and UK and all of uh, uh, England and France and all, all, the, all the different uh, uh, nations that uh, captured slaves, um, primarily from Africa, uh, and instituted what we know to be chattel slavery. Just know that that does not exist in the Bible at all. However, we have all been made to believe that what took place in America had something to do with God. And so we took it as a people. Uh, 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 it, it, it brought us to such, to such degradation and humility, but we swallowed it and took it because we somehow believe God did it. And of course, those who did it to us taught us that it came from the scriptures. They said that uh, Noah... Uh, curse uh, Ham, which the Bible didn't even teach. The Bible said no curse Canaan, which was Ham's son. But again, all of this convoluted, uh, distorted information uh, was taught uh, to us in the culture. And uh, many white people, uh, 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 again, are confused about this as well as black folk. Are. So anyway, let's move on. Um, chapter five, I talk about freed slaves weren't actually free. Because if you know anything about the Emancipation Proclamation, uh, when Lincoln wrote it, number one, in 1863, uh, he didn't have the authority to free slaves. Uh, but he wrote it and, and threw it out there. And then the, the, the proclamation freed the slaves only in the southern states where the Confederacy were, where they were warring against. It didn't have anything to do with the slaves anywhere else in the country. So technically... 
the, the slaves weren't free when they claimed they were free. Uh, number six, the color of the Jews in Jesus. I'm delving deep into the ethnicity of the people of the Bible. This is this is what's gonna gonna be a real shaker for you. I had a guy that called me <laughs> from Alabama because he heard my last feed, and uh, he said, "Well, since I can't buy the book right now, uh, can you tell me a little bit about what's in this chapter?" Uh, and uh, so we got on the phone. Uh, sometime later, and we had this discussion, and I'm not going to give it all away, away to you right now. You're going to have to get the book. Uh, number chapter 7, I talk about Abraham's seed and slave. Chapter 8, slavery crimes. When you understand what actually took place on slave plantations, and you understand what's in the Bible, then you'll know uh, that what took place was actually crimes against huma humanity. And so I'm, I'm bringing that out as well. I'm talking about uh, the crimes that took place during slavery. Uh, for 100 years after slavery, there were still more crimes. So I, I address all of that. In chapter 10, uh, I talk about race, ethnicity, and Christianity. Now, I have a, 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 a great friend. He's a retired general a retired general. We met about five years ago and uh, we had breakfast uh, this past Monday, Monday morning, and he got a copy of this book and he said, Ed, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to work, I'm going to read the book, and then I'm going to get back to you to give you my take on it. Again, this guy is a retired general. Here's what he sent back to me yesterday, and I'm going to read it to you verbatim. He said, afternoon, my brother. I finished your book this afternoon. I found chapter 10 to be the most powerful, followed by chapter 12. Great job. Lots of thinking points. Okay. This was, this was his reply to me. And uh, what I'm talking about in chapter 10 uh, is race, ethnicity, and Christianity. And what I'm going to show you in this chapter what we have in America is a socially engineered structure called race. No other nation in the history of the world defined the people based on how we define race here in America. And I'm breaking all that down because this is what was done by Christians, okay? They took that Bible, bastardized it, and uh, use it for nefarious purposes. So I'm breaking all that down. Chapter 11 I'm talking about America, a Christian nation, and I'll give you the breakdown on that and tell you whether or not America is a Christian nation based on its own founding documents, okay? Don't just, don't just let people just blow smoke in your ear and tell you stuff. You need to do your own research. This is what I've been doing for nearly 50 years. I've, I've, I got saved in 1974, so I'm 49 years into, into learning uh, the Bible and the kingdom of God through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit and not from the culture. I didn't go to a seminary uh, to get this, and I'm glad I didn't because they would have destroyed my head. But the Holy Spirit uh, didn't want that for me. Uh, and, 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 and I'm not saying that to be derogatory about seminary. Uh, even though I have my issues with them. If, you, if you've got a good foundation and you go to seminary, that's good as long as you don't let the professors confuse you because a lot of that goes on and I, I'm not going to bog down there. And then in the last chapter, um, I, I, I flesh all of this out because the only reason why I'm addressing the issues uh, that have plagued us for the last uh, 400 years in this country is because we have we have placed uh, 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 the emphasis of all of this 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 bad information. We've used the Bible to justify it. So unless we dissect it, that's why the book is titled "An Autopsy." Okay, uh, when someone dies, uh, uh, particularly under suspicious causes, uh, you 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 go in as a forensic scientist and you pull that body apart and you examine. Every, every parts of it and what all that happened to it and what caused it to die. That's why I'm going through the first nine chapters to bring up all of this, this, this information that was fed into our culture and we are believing it 
and thinking that is in the Bible, okay? And that's why I'm addressing that way. And then the last chapter, again, it, it all get fleshes out because I'm talking about kingdom, which is where we should have been from day one, okay? If the, if the, if the founders of America and, and, and those who, who came to the colonies as Christians, if they were actually teaching a kingdom message based on the Bible itself, there would be no slavery and there would be no racism as we know it in America and the world. Plain and simple, okay? So uh, let, me, let, me, uh, let me give you a few more um, of uh, the, the forewords of uh, the individual who, who responded uh, to what I wrote. This, this comes from Brad Atkins. Brad is a Southern Baptist uh, pastor. He served in 2012 as the president of the Southern Baptist Convention here in South Carolina. He passes Lake Bourne uh, uh, Baptist Church. He said, dear, uh, my dear friend Ed Johnson has taken on a monumental task uh, that this book deals with. As he states, the problem with racism in the world today is race itself. One cannot with any intellectual honesty defend the topic of race as we know it, which is uh, based on skin color, unless they are ignorant of history. May God use this book to help shed light on the reality that in Christ there is no black or white. Thank you, uh, Pastor Brad. Uh, Brad and I had lunch uh, back in January. He was here in town uh, for a conference and I visited with him. Tremendous brother, uh, he shared. Let me, give you, let me give you another one. This one comes from Hal Stevenson. Hal is also uh, a white brother that I met uh, back in 2000, I, I think 16 or 17, when I held the pre I mean, a, a, a clergy conference in, in Charleston and we brought the governor in town and uh, he owns a sign company uh, in Columbia and he donated a digital sign for us to promote the governor uh, coming to town. He said uh, in his episode to the Ephesians, the Apostle Paul urges believers to speak the truth in love. Dr. Johnson epitomizes this principle in his book. In the tradition of Dr. Martin Luther King, he speaks truth concerning the injustices that have been perpetuated against Africans brought to America as slaves and their descendants. But in love, he urges his readers to not give in to the bitterness and the division, but to pursue unity, especially those of the house. Hold of Faith. This is Hal Stevenson, Chief Development Officer of the Power of Grace Sign Company in Columbia, South Carolina. Tremendous guy. And as I said, uh, this is a white gentleman. I'm going to give you one more. Um, this one comes from uh, my new friend that I met since I uh, started writing this book. In fact, I was, I was just, uh, I completed it, but it was in the editing uh, stages, and I met Butch, uh, I started writing the book back in May. I met him probably in July somewhere, July, August, and uh, we had lunch for the first time at Cracker Barrel in North Charleston, and of course we started talking about the book and about my life, my history, his history, and long story short, um, we had numerous meetings since that time. We sat across the table, had the hard conversation for hours on end, and he read the book from cover to cover, asking me all of the questions he wanted to ask. And here is what he wrote back to me as a foreword for the book. Now, uh, Butch speaks for himself. He said, I'm white, conservative, traditional, an elder, and I'm Southern. As a Christ follower and a Bible believer, listen to this, I always thought that slavery in the Bible was the same as the slavery in America. I had done some research on slavery and thought that I had a pretty good knowledge of its history. That is until my friend, Pastor Ed Johnson, introduced me to his new book. It has opened my eyes and my heart to consider our American Christian history from another perspective. It provides understanding and a way to start brotherly relationship to heal wounds and clear up misconceptions 
with each other and in our churches. Jesus said, a new command I give you, love one another as I love you, so you must love one another. Then he said, in closing, this book is a good place to start the conversation. So, as you can see, and I know uh, that, that this information is extremely insightful. Uh, I know that it's, it, it, it can be extremely inflammatory to a lot of people based on where their mindset is. And all I'm doing is addressing three decades of my experiences uh, in, in the city where I live, dealing with both black and white pastors, particularly on the topic of politics and race. And this is what I'm addressing in these books. And so uh, these white gentlemen that, are, that, are, that I'm reading uh, uh, from today about what they wrote based on what's in the book should basically tell you everything you need to know, okay? At least about me. If you have, if you have or had any misgivings about me, uh, about what my what my what my thoughts are, what you may preconceive about me, this should tell you uh, everything you need to know. Because the, the the individuals that I'm quoting are white gentlemen. So okay, so 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 there's never been a racist bone in my body. Uh, that's not the way my parents raised us. To this day, uh, my parent, my mom died 17 years ago. My dad, he's still he's still pushing. Uh, he just had his 99th birthday um, uh, on Veterans Day this year. I went to the house uh, two days ago, uh, and you know what my dad was doing? He was laying down on the ground on a piece of cardboard repairing the cop radar on his wood buster, <laughs> okay, at 99 years of age. That, that's what he was doing. Uh, but never, even to this day, have I ever heard anything negative or derogatory from my parents about white people. So I've, I didn't learn anything racist from them. There was never anything racist in me as I got older and then, of course, got into the culture. I went to integrated school and, uh, for the first time in high school at the age of uh, uh, 16 and started in, intermingling with white people more than ever before. But what I learned is that there's basically no difference. Uh, you know, we, we, had, we had issues among white kids. We had issues among black kids. And so that's just human nature. And then when I went into the military and got reborn, born again, and uh, I got on the street called straight like the Apostle Paul when he was on his road to, to Damascus. And the Holy Spirit took me on a journey uh, over the last 50 years that is, that is phenomenal. I'm still trying to figure out how all this happened. But it's so exciting. And I can tell you, everything that you're going to read in this book is designed to teach you the truth. And if people don't want to know the truth, then it's up to them. And speaking of the truth, let me read you uh, the last um, uh, thing I want to read to you. This is the, the, the ultimate foreword um, from a pastor uh, that is uh, in Buford. Uh, in fact, uh, we uh, spoke just the other day because I have a book signing schedule in Buford and I was getting some information from him. Here's, here's, the, here's the foreword in the book. Uh, from Pastor Alex McBride. He said, your book is thoroughly refreshing. One of, if not the best nonfiction book that I've read. In my opinion, this book should be a, listen to this, bestseller if people love the truth. God raises up men and women for such a time to relay upon the conscience of a people or nation the need for truth and vision, as well as the need to answer for the conduct of their actions. Martin Luther King for the Civil Rights Movement, Moses for the Israelites, and listen to this, your book fits right along in there for the conscience of this nation. Can you believe that? Now, I didn't ask this guy to say this. I actually, uh, I was in, 
I went to, we went, the wife and I went on vacation, I think in September, went on vacation to, uh, to Myrtle Beach, and we knew we had an itinerary. We were going to leave Myrtle Beach and go to other places. So we left Myrtle Beach, then we went somewhere else. I can't even remember the, the place now. She wanted to go get some fresh, fresh spring water. I think it was out of uh, Bamberg, somewhere out there. Don't, don't quote me. But then we went from there to uh, Hilton Head, and we spent, we spent the night. In Hilton Head, and of course I knew Hilton Head was close to Buford, and I knew Buford was where um, Robert Smalls had settled, and I talk about the whole history there. So I went to Buford, and uh, and uh, from Hilton Head to Buford, visited the house that Robert Smalls owned, who was an ex-slave who lived in Charleston during the Civil War. He hijacked a, a sea vessel, took his family. And, and went to uh, Buford into uh, uh, safe territory with the Union Army. The Union Army took him in and uh, made him a captain, okay? So he, he, he fled the Confederacy and went to the Union Army and became a captain. This is all Robert Small's history. All this history is in Buford. And uh, I was there, and, and we were uh, leaving the house because it's a monument now. You, you can go there and see all of this stuff. I was leaving Robert Small's house driving down the street, heading out of town, two blocks down the street, not even knowing uh, that I was going to, you know, uh, see this church, but it was a church on the left side, and there was this white white girl there sitting on the porch at the church with her dog. So I, I thought it was, it was a white church. And, uh, and she said to me, uh, and I asked her, I said, well, what kind of church is this? And she told me, she said, the pastor's inside. So I got out, went inside, and uh, the uh, Pastor McBride, this is who I'm talking about now, was sitting there um, uh, on his computer. And I started to engage him and tell him that I was writing a book, that I had Robert Smalls written in, you know, the, the book and all that stuff. And he's like, wow. He said, come here, let me, let, me, let me show you something. So he took me around the back and showed me this is Robert Smalls' church that he's pastoring now 150 years later. And he showed me uh, Robert Smalls' name up on the wall where he had paid his dues of 25 cents you know, uh, back in 1860, 18, whatever, during that, that period. I mean, it was, it was quite tremendous. Um, and so I told him about the book and I said to him, uh, I'd like to, you know, have some pre-readers, you know, for my book. Would you consider reading it as well? He said, of course, I'd love to read it. And, uh, so I sent him the book along with about 30 or 40 other guys. And, uh, he, he wrote me back this information within two days. Okay. Um, and let me wrap it up with him. He said, once I started to read your book, I got angry and could not wake up fast enough to finish it today. It is truly that interesting. I also see this as a wake up call for those uh, that are in authority to recognize and preach truth. And of course, this is about pastors of churches and religious leaders. There can and should be a marriage of true Christianity and good works in our near and far neighborhoods, especially by the church. True peace and justice and righteousness will not be accomplished until Christ return. Alex McBride, pastor of the First African Baptist Church in Buford. Now, uh, the church that, that, that Alex McBride is pastoring was birthed out of the First African Baptist Church uh, in Savannah. My wife and I visited that church about four or five years ago, and what we discovered in that church, uh, that church was started doing slavery before the Civil War, okay, owned, uh, uh, by black slaves, okay? In that church right now, if you go to Buford, I recommend that you go and visit the church. That, pew, that, that church has in the balcony pews with Hebrew and Aramaic writing on it, okay? Now, what does that mean exactly? I'm glad you asked. I will tell you because I'm discussing it all in the book. Now, this is up at the beginning of the book, and uh, what I have here uh, is the objective for the book. What I want people to take away when they get through reading it, okay? This is what I want you to understand. The objectives of this book is to convey five things. Number one, chattel slavery 
did not exist in the Bible, okay? It was not the culture of the Israelites. And when you start to read chapter 1 and chapter 2, and you see what's in the Bible, the Bible that you have, when you read it, you'll get the clarity. Number two, encoded racial trappings, such as black and white and other divisive categories, is yet in the American culture. And the only reason why I'm called a black man, somebody else is called a, a white man, and notice it's primarily a black and white man. No, no other ethnicity has bought into this color. You don't hear Japanese people calling themselves black or white. You don't hear from Chinese people. Why, why is that only black and white people call themselves black and white based on race? It's because of the white supremacy um, social engineering of the country. We're not going to get around that, Christians. So if we don't face this truth, we're bound to stay boggled down in it, and that's exactly what Satan wants to do. Uh, number three, most of the kidnapped Africans were Israelites and Muslims as well, descendants of Abraham, who was trying to flee for their life during the Spanish Inquisition during that time, and you got to, again, study the history. I, 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 I open it up for you in the book so you get to see some of it. Most of the people who came here on slave ship were Israelites. Uh, and I have another book. Um, I don't have it. Uh, my friend bought it from me yesterday. <laughs> They're in the bookstore. But it's titled, These Were God's People. I wrote that book in 2005. And I give you that history. I tell you how the Israelites uh, got dispersed from Jerusalem in the first century uh, when, it, when, when, when the city was, was seized by Titus, the Roman uh, 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 general, in 70 AD. Now, Jesus left the earth in 33 AD after his resurrection. He descended back to heaven. But if you read Matthew 24, 25 in there, you'll see he prophesied that Jerusalem was going to be destroyed, that the temple was going to be destroyed because they rejected his message. That happened. All of the historical documentation, if you study the history of Christianity, you see it all there. You study the history of the Jews. One of the, one of the most noted uh, historians uh, was a Jewish historian, uh, Flavius Josephus. Uh, he's one of, the, one of the most prolific writers of this era. You go back and read his information and you'll, and, you'll, and, you'll, and you'll see all this. So the Jews fled Israel. Jews, the Negroes, because that's who they were, fled Israel and they went all over, they were dispersed all into different different uh, other countries, Asia, uh, Europe, all up into Northern Europe, all into Africa. And of course, they were closer to Africa. They were right in Africa. They spent uh, two, two centuries in Africa with the Egyptians. But because of white supremacy and because of this information, you purposely being left out of the books and them never teaching you that, we just thought, we were savages like the white folks told us we were and treated us like savages, okay? All this information got left out of the history books. But God is not going to let Satan trod over his people but for so long. He's going to chastise us and then eventually bring us back to the knowledge of the truth. And all of what's happening today is a part of it. I don't know how much of the... Uh, the Kyrie Irving and the Kanye West saga you watched over the last couple of months with the with the with the uh, uh, the Jews uh, and, and Kyrie, of course, saying you know he can't be an anti-Semite when he himself is a, is a, is an Israelite. You know all that information. If you were confused about it, I teach you in this book, and I don't have a lot of details in here, just enough for you to understand. You know what the 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 backdrop of the conversation, but in these were God's people, and you can find that book on Amazon.com as well. I, I address all of that issue, those issues. So, so uh, the kidnapped, uh, the kidnapped uh, 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 slaves who were stolen, brought here, were Jews. Most of them, not all of them. And uh, number four, Christ conquered with the gospel, not weapons. Christianity is the most bloody religion of all religions that I've ever studied. Just, just go back, starting back from the disciples straight out of Pentecost when they were being abused by 
the Romans and the Jews, and most of all of the disciples were murdered uh, uh, through, through, through the hostile uh, Roman government as well as the, 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 the leadership of the Israelites. For the first two centuries, the Jews were brutalized those, those saints who got saved, those Jews who got saved, those Gentiles who got saved were brutalized by the Roman government who actually eventually and socially engineered what we call Christianity today. That started with the Romans in 313, okay? So, uh, so all of this history is, 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 is here for your, for your perusal, for you to learn it. And uh, I'm sharing it with you because this is the journey that I've been on uh, for the last um, 40 years, okay? And the, and the last one, well, let me, let me emphasize, Christ nor his disciples. Nowhere on the planet can you go and study where the disciples went anywhere and fought people with weapons, okay? So no Christian on the planet can tell you that they conquered people with guns and cannons and all of the other stuff that they did because they were doing it for Christ unless they are telling you a lie, okay? And we know the history of America. We know how it was established. We know what happened to the people that were here before the colonizers came and what happened. And, 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 and we put all this on Christ and Christianity, and it may be Christianity, but it's definitely not Christ, okay? All right, and the last one, which is, again, it all get fleshes out because this has all got to take us somewhere. We just can't, you know, bring up all of this stuff and stir in it and then get mad and spit on each other and cuss each other out because we don't think, we don't think there's any end in sight, okay? What we have to understand is that God, oh, uh, my phone's bugging me. God, all along, wanted to bring unity to his body, and I'm addressing that in the last chapter. Chapter 12 is all kingdom believers irrespective of their local church or their denomination or what race they claim or ethnicity should have a kingdom unity strategy to gather to impact their cities. Okay? There's no way in the world we can be completing the great commission that Jesus left on record when he taught that we should be one people the disciples understood this when you get into the epistles uh, that there were one people and they had one agenda and that is to advance Christ's agenda to the world to both Jews and Gentiles to get people delivered and get them saved. And if you go back to the book of Acts where it all spawned out of in the 42nd verse of Acts chapter 2, the Bible says, and they, they being the apostles and the disciples, they continue daily going from house to house, breaking bread, fellowshipping, and praying together. So they understood this whole kingdom unity, okay? Christians today don't understand what took place in the early life of the, 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 the believers in the New Testament. And that's why we have so much convoluted teachings. With all these, all these denominations, the last I checked, there's some, some 40,000 factions. And I say factions because that's what they are. Anytime you can have a, a, a Baptist church on this corner, a Methodist church on this corner, a Presbyterian church on this corner. In fact, uh, five minutes away from, from where I am right now, speaking to you in the inner city of Somerville, uh, in what's called the Old Village, there's probably 20 churches in that little community, okay? And I can tell you there is no strategy among the leadership of those churches to work together to advance the spiritual and the moral uh, uh, well-being of, of the city of Somerville. Now, over the past few years, there have been, you know, some... Uh, uh, smaller groups, not the pastors, because the pastors are the, are the toughest one to get this message to. And I'm a pastor. I've dealt with this stuff for 30 years, so I, I, I know where they are. But there's some leg people that are going around trying to, to declare Christian unity, but that's not coming from pastors. And the reason why it's not coming from pastors, because we see a church as a power base, okay? And when we go out into the community, 
we go we go we go to the community like football coaches go to, to go to the Satoma Classic. That's what they you know, when when all of the football uh, uh, players the team come out on the field and they have a big jammery for that night. We're going out there to see which one of these guys we're going to beat. That's what that's what coaches do when they go to play against each other and pastors think the same way for the most part. Not all of them, but most of them. Okay? They think like politicians. They're turf hungry. It's about power and control. And the only reason why I'm putting all of this on blast, because this is what I fought for the last 30 years, trying to bring unity to our city. There's not one person in the city of Charleston that was more proactive in trying to bring pastors together in this city in the last three decades than the person you're looking at right now. And that's because when I bought a radio station back in 1992, the Holy Spirit spoke to me. God said to me, go and tell the pastors and the politicians in the city of Charleston, it's time to tear down these walls, racial walls and denominational walls and work together. And I've got paraphernalia in my possession right now. It go all the way back to 1992, letters from a former mayor, former mayor of Charleston, the former mayor of North Charleston, the former mayor of Mount Pleasant, uh, the former chief, uh, uh, police chief, Reuben Greenberg, uh, former sheriff Al Cannon over the county. I've got letters on my desk right now from these guys that I said these exact, exact same words to that I'm sharing with you 30 years ago. Okay, so, so I'm, I'm not the guy uh, that you're going to catch uh, uh, flipping on the message <laughs> because the message is not going to change. Christ died for a body. He didn't die for body parts. Okay. And as long as we are a disjointed and everybody on their own corner, you got a church on this corner and, and the one right next uh, across the street and the fellas can't get together for the corner. I told you, uh, uh last week on one of the videos that I made, uh, that, uh, the church where the nine, uh, parishioners, including the pastor, got murdered in Charleston. Emmanuel Church uh, is it, uh, shares church shares parking lot with the uh, the uh, Baptist Church, and I don't remember the name of it, but it's a Southern Baptist Church, and it's not First Baptist, but it's a Baptist Church uh, on the corner of Calhoun and Meaning Street. They share parking lots. Okay, when Emmanuel Nine happened, uh, several days later, I got an email. Um, because of my activity in the community to go to a prayer vigil at Emmanuel Church. You know, we're praying for the community. When I got there, the, the doors on the church was locked. So uh, a couple of other guys came in behind me. They said, well, it's across the street. So we go, uh, not across the street, on the same side of the street. As I said, they share parking lots. So if you've ever been to Charleston, you know what I'm talking about. Um, uh, the Baptist Church and the Amy Church if, if, if with your left hand, you can throw a rock from one church to the next. OK. And so when we got there, uh, went uh, into the prayer, we all prayed about an hour or so. And as we were wrapping it up, the pastor of the church, uh, uh, David, I don't remember his last name. He's not there anymore, but he was closing out the prayer. And he said that God told him to go meet Pastor Clemente Pinckney. I don't know how many years they were there together. Right there, could touch each other, you know, across, across the parking lot and never met. This is how divisive religion is. And I make no bones about putting it on blast because, again, God is tired. If we can, if we can just, just open our eyes and see what's happening from the top down, from Washington, D.C., down into our community, with all of these trappings that the enemy is pouring into us while Christians are oblivious to the kingdom of God and what the Holy Spirit is trying to do. Okay? And I'm going to have to stop. Let me see if I can finish up with what I wanted to tell you. We'll, we'll wrap this up. Um, I have a book signing. On the 11th in Goose Creek at Turning Pages, uh, February 11th at noon. So if you want to meet me there, I, I plan to be there. Uh, that's directly across from Walmart on St. James Avenue or 176. Uh, I also have, um, uh, I'll be making an appearance on Bounce Around Charleston. That's a television show that comes on 
uh, uh, Randolph Miller. Uh, he is the executive producer of that show, I believe it is. Uh, but I communicated with him, and I'm going to be going on that show as well. Uh, I've also communicated over the last week or so with the Post and Courier. Uh, they're going to be doing um, a write-up on it in the Faith and Values section. I have... Uh, probably about seven or eight articles behind me where I've been in the Post and Courier uh, for many different times for stuff like this. One of the most recent was when I spearheaded uh, the historical marker for the town of Lincolnville. This was about three years ago, and we have that historical marker here documenting the history of this town, something that I didn't know about when I came here some 40 years ago, and then I've come full circle, and uh, the guy who founded this town was actually the pastor of Emmanuel, where the nine people got murdered 150 years ago. And before that church was Emmanuel, it was Hempstead AME, and it was on the east side of Charleston, and that's where Denmark Vesey was a charter member. And when the Vesey, Vesey uprising was, was, was plotted and it got thwarted, Vesey and 34 other guys got hung. I talk about all this in the book as well got hung for treason, and then that church got demolished, and uh, uh, black people could not have any large gathering from 1822 when they got hung up until 1865 uh, after the Civil War. Um, in fact, the Citadel College, one of the most prestigious college in America, was established to suppress black people. Okay? That all took place right here in the city of Charleston. So I'm, I'm talking about this information. So in 1865, the AME Church sent Richard Harvey Kane to Charleston to Hempstead AME. He gets there, rallied up the few handful of members that was left, and they, they bought the land that's on Calhoun Street, resurrected the church, and renamed it to Emmanuel, saying that God was, 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 was with us the whole time they were underground uh, between 1822 and 1865. Harvey Kane grew that church to over 3,000 members. He became one of the most powerful figures in Charleston. He uh, became a politician. He was a, he was a Republican, and, and that time, vast majority of all black people were Republicans because it was a Republican party that fought to liberate the, the blacks from the South. Um, uh, and, and, and so uh, during that era, uh, Kane was a Republican, and so was uh, Robert Smalls, who, who, who went into the Confederate Army. They were all Republican. And, and for 100 years, basically all black people were Republicans uh, 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 during that time. And so he got on the railroad looking for property as an enclave for freed black families from Charleston. He founded this piece of property where I'm sitting on right now. It's called Lincolnville. Uh, he founded it. And it was called Pomp Pond because the train would stop here and get water. And then when Lincoln got uh, uh, assassinated uh, early on in 1865, um, when they incorporated the town, uh, they renamed it Lincolnville. So that's the history. Okay? Uh, let's wrap this up. Get the book. I'm going to put your name in a drawing. Only if you write your name in the book and take a picture because I don't want you to slick me now. <laughs> Okay, I, I, I'm, 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 I'm being facetious, but I know everybody is not honest. I'm, I'm going to have to prove that, that it's your book, okay, and that you're not taking a picture of somebody else's book to get my $500,000, okay? I'm just keeping it real. So, so if you take a picture of the book, documenting your signature, send it to my email address, dr.edwardleejohnson at gmail.com. I'm going to list it on, my, um, on the live after we're done. Or to my, uh, text it to me. To my phone, 843-330-7807. Uh, I'm going to take a picture of your information and put you in the pot. Okay? Uh, NVC, all of all of NVC, those of you who are listening to me or you listen later, I want you to order your book. Even though I'm ordering hundreds of books to put in the bookstore, I'll give you back uh, one of the books that I order. And the reason why I want you to do this because when it comes to a book being a bestseller coming out the gate, a, an author <laughs> can't buy up all of his books and make himself a bestseller. You know, that's, that's you know, it, 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 it wouldn't even be worth it to do that. Um, that'll be defeating uh, the, the, the whole point. 
people from around the community who believe in what you're doing have to go on these venues and buy the books. And that's how they're going to determine, you know, about the, the you know, how many books are sold and, and the bestsellers. So even though I'm going to be buying the books, um, you're not going to pay for it twice. I'm going to give you one of mine. Order it off of Zulon Press. If you can get to them, if you have a problem, go to any one of the venues, Amazon, Books A Million, um, uh, Walmart. It's all on their, on their website. Order the book, please. Please do that. And then I'll trade you out the ones. It should be here hopefully by next week. I'll trade you out the one uh, that I'm going to have um, and give it to you. In fact, I'm probably going to get mine before you get yours because uh, the book is going to be released officially tomorrow. So if you order it today or tomorrow, it's still probably going to take two weeks. And, and I'll have mine here. So you'll get yours before you can get mine before yours come in the mail to you. You just got to show me your receipt because uh, I'm going to give it to you. You don't have to pay for it. All you're going to do is swap yours back in to me. Okay. Does that make sense? Okay. All right, guys. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm wrapping it up. I saw uh, quite a bit of comments on here and I'm not going to go through them online. I'm going to search through them and, um, and respond uh, to your uh, comments uh, offline. I'll, I'll do that. Um, unless you got something specifically you want to ask me while I'm on, but thank you. Thank you for watching. I really do appreciate you wholeheartedly for, for, for laboring on this, this line. I, I was trying to hold the 40 minutes, but it's almost an hour. Um, but I think I got it all out now. Uh, and I really, 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 really do appreciate you. Uh, I'm going to the painstaking measure to labor uh, online like this so people can, you know, see my face, read my body language, so you'll see there's not a, there's not a bone in my body uh, that wants to do anything or say anything harmful against anybody. Okay, this whole fight of mine is against evil, which comes from Satan himself. Now, unfortunately, we are caught up in the crosshairs of what he's done. But unless we get this right, we're never going to move forward. We can't move forward. Okay, so all I'm trying to tell you is that this is our season. It's kingdom time now, and the devil can't stop this. Okay, God spoke to Daniel in Daniel chapter 7. If you go to Daniel chapter 7, God spoke to him and said that kingdom is going to rise and fall and rise and fall and rise and fall until the ancient of days. Daniel was a young boy uh, in Babylon, you know, captured from, from, from Jerusalem. Uh, but God was working in him and those Israelites through all of the turmoil that they were going through to get this inspired word of the Bible to us. There's too much, too much blood and, and tears and death uh, that has been shed to get that Bible to us for us not to understand what's in it. And so that's a part of my assignment to help break that down and explain it. And I can tell you everything in here can be backed up by the Bible, okay? Everything that I'm teaching you in this book is all in the scriptures. In fact, this book has scriptures all through it because I don't teach anything else except it's the Bible. I have a few documentation of what took place here in America in the history of America um, to, to make the case in the book, uh, but that's because of what Christians did and blame it on the Bible. So I'm going to show you what the disciples and what, what the real believers did in the Bible versus what those who were perpetrating a fraud and using the Bible did. So everything that I'm teaching you, you can find in the book, in the Bible. Everything that's in this book, you can find in the Bible. Get your book, guys. Get your book. Please get the book. All right. I'm going to be waiting to... Uh, Get your information. As I said, I'll put my number and my email address on the live. So when I get off, it'll be reposted if you don't remember what it was. And uh, go order your book, ZulonPress.com. All you got to do is uh, get on your phone. When, when, when the website comes up, type in the name, The Autopsy of Slavery. The book will pop up in front of your face, and then you can order it. Father, we thank you for another tremendous opportunity to share with these special uh, people who have been online with me. 
for the last hour as I talk about the things that are important uh, to them and, and to your kingdom. I pray that you enlighten and inspire their hearts and their mind. Help them to understand. I know if they're hearing me for the very first time, this is a lot to handle. But let them hear what the Spirit is saying to their hearts. Because this is the Holy Spirit that's making this announcement. I pray in Jesus' name. Speaking of the Holy Spirit, I uh, have another book that I started writing since writing this book. I started writing this book in May, around the, around the 22nd of May. And probably about two months later, I got the inspiration to write another book, which is titled The Infilling of the Holy Spirit, subtitled Crisis Discipline for Kingdom Living. That book is being published as we speak by Trinity Broadcasting Network. Trinity has a publishing uh, um, subsidiary called Trilogy Publishing. Trilogy is publishing the infilling of the Holy Spirit. Zulan, the largest Christian book publisher in the country, uh, has published uh, The Autopsy of Slavery. Okay, so um, yeah, you 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 in for a tremendous treat. I'm going to be doing uh, lives throughout. Uh, this is this is my ministry, so I'm glad that you're on. Uh, if you're in the Charleston area, come come see us at at, at Lincolnville, 128 West Hamilton Street. Uh, we're a family oriented church. I tell people that families are the foundation of the kingdom of God. And if you don't understand the purpose of the family, you don't understand God. And I teach that we're building a $2 million cultural center uh, as we speak, all designed to, to, to accommodate family activities. We're going to have a basketball and um, a foosball, pool, uh, table, tennis, jump castle for the kids, a video arcade. You're going to have a recording studio, a television studio, a commercial a uh, kitchen, uh, a large venue for, for, for children's church. We're going to have a counseling center in there for, for trauma. Uh, we're going to have a, 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 um, a ministry uh, dealing with, with health. I'm going to start uh, for the first time in the history of the planet that I know of what's called a Centennial Club. And what that means is if you want to live to be 100, okay, uh, God willing, I'm going to, to, to provide you with some extremely important uh, health uh, information, spiritual information that's going to get you on the journey uh, to make 100. Now, I told you uh, that my dad, uh, hey, Charles, I'm glad you got on. Bless you, my brother. I told you my dad, uh, he's 99 and he's running up to 100. At, as agile as he is, there's no reason why he's not going to make it there. I told you I was there yesterday. He's down on the ground on a cardboard, putting, uh, fixing the carburetor on his wood buster. What's a 99-year-old man doing, uh, doing something like that? What, 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 what is this? He's Abraham, okay? Uh, the Bible said when the angel showed up at, uh, at Abraham's tent, after he had, uh, the angel had told him, uh, God told him he was going to have a son, and uh, it took 25 years for, for Isaac to come. Well, around that the, the year 99, the angel shows up to Abraham's house. He's 99 years of age now, and the angels told him, by this time next year, you're going to have that promised son. He'd waited 25 years. He'd made a, him and Sarah made a mess with Ishmael, uh, uh, but it's 25, 24 years into the promise. The angel said, this time next year, Isaac is coming. What did Abraham do? The Bible says Abraham fell on the ground, belly laughing. Now, can you imagine a 100-year-old, a 99-year-old man walling all over the ground, uh, uh, laughing hysterically uh, with excitement that he had gotten this great news from an angel? Well, I'm telling you, if you have that kind of enthusiasm in your heart, and you, and you begin to do some of the proper things uh, uh, as far as your eating habits. Now, God ultimately makes this decision as to how long we're going to live. So don't, don't, don't misunderstand anything I say. Uh, uh, but if you do all of your part and the Lord's willing, uh, I'm going to show you 
how to get to 100 like my dad, because that's what I plan to do. And we're going to have a centennial club, and we'll have a lot of stuff written down so you can learn how to, you know, you know, prescribe to certain just good eating habits and, you know, keep your mind right. And, and that's really what it's all about. I mean, I know you can't tell that I'm almost 70. I know I look like I'm about 38. Um, <laughs> oh, gotcha, gotcha. Uh, but I've been practicing, you know, good eating habits, uh, for 40 years. So, someone gave me a book called Back to Eden uh, in 19, I think it was around 82, 83. Do you not know in the original diet, if you go back to Genesis 1, 1 26 uh, through 30 in there, man, uh, uh, God gave us our diet and man was a vegetarian. Okay. Uh, meat came along later and, you know, I don't want you to get hurt about your meat, um, but excessive anything is not good. And I think you know, you know, we got a problem in America with excessive eating. The only time in human history, more people are dying from eating too much food than people are dying from not eating enough food. Now, this is this is uh, from a statistic that comes from doctors. More people are dying from eating too much food because we're eating too much of the wrong kind of food. I didn't got off to something altogether different. I'm trying to stop. I'm trying to finish. And uh, I'm looking at you all, and uh, I guess y'all are waiting for me to just say uh, I'm done. But uh, I'll close it out. Thank you for watching. I'm going to repost it, and I'm also going to put the information so you can start taking pictures and send me your information so I can put your name in the hat. I want you to win the money. I want you to have it. I want to give it to you as an incentive for buying the book. Love you guys. Bye.